Vargas, we made it, dog. We've made it. Episode 20. And it's a of, big one. And it's a big one. Like, you know, um, we'd been talking for a few episodes that, oh, yeah, man, like, we're going to do the anniversary. So, like, yeah. today would have been the 20th anniversary episode. Cool episode, right? But yeah. sorry. You, you move, you're moving to 21. We're having to move <laughs> you. Okay? Because from yep. last episode, we talked about how, like, the last ep- last time you heard us, we were yes. talking about random. We sent out, you know, a feeler to Dan Southworth about, hey man, maybe interviewing you at a SAC anime because we and it was a quick thing mm-hmm. of like we just realized he's going to be there, and it was a fast turnaround. <laughs> he messaged back right away. I'm uh, pretty positive that Margus might have left some in there about like twenty five hundred, <laughs> you know, a little bit like that's a daily rate. We ended up coming to a different financial agreement, one that was I was like very surprised by, but also happy by because we are still a growing podcast, yep. you know, um, <laughs> just a quick, I guess, tease. Um, Dan didn't even want to take the full amount we agreed upon. He wanted oh. less just because he had a great time, which yeah should get everyone excited to listen to the interview. It's um, an hour long interview. An hour long interview. By the way, we didn't assume it would be an hour long. Um, no, we had no idea. No idea. Uh, let's also, you know what? No, Let, let's just get to the interview with Dan, and then we'll we'll talk a little bit after. Uh, what do you think, Marcus, about how how things went to be? Because it's almost like the stars aligned. It perfectly did. So, yep. Here it is, everyone. Our interview with Dan Southworth, aka Eric Myers, Quantum Ranger. What's up? This is Rangers of the Grid. It's Richard. And Marcus. And we're here with Dan Southworth. Y'all know who this is. The Quantum Ranger himself. The one and only. He ain't got his Q-Rex here. No. But he's here. But I could do this. Uh, Oh! oh, That's all we need. I'm not going to lie, Dan. When I saw you, I was like, dude, this guy's in shape. I'm all right. I'm doing all right. Some of my colleagues are in better shape than I am. Well, no. uh, what a few months ago we were lucky enough to interview Steve Cardenas. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, real quick at a at a con like there at his table, mm-hmm. he was in really good shape too. Yeah, he, and I was like, dude, what's up? Like I told him, I was we, like, dude, you guys look the he, same. He like, still but, does his jujitsu. I'm yeah. still doing jujitsu as well. I'm still training. I still spar twenty year old dudes and uh, <laughs> got keep bu- you young. Huh? And thankfully, I have a l- enough experience to pull some tricks out of the bag and there you go. surprise those young bucks. But like I told Marcus, I'm like, dude, it's awesome seeing our childhood heroes. Yeah, they still look like our like childhood our childhood heroes. heroes. That that might be rarer than it used to be. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, a lot of us are trying to prolong our careers so we're we're staying healthy and staying in shape and, you know our childhood heroes all got very uh, unhealthy <laughs> oh, except yeah. for a few there's stallone still stays in shape although you know who knows what kind of drugs he's pumped in his oh yeah oh like, I know. Let's, like, let's be real uh schwarzenegger still stays in shape although i know he he's he's pumped a lot of stuff into his body. although i did see him out of shape when he's yeah. governor, yeah. like right down the street, me and my friends after college, or not college, high school graduation, strolling around here downtown, like, let's go to the Capitol. Right. Yeah. And then he, I guess he just had some press conference and we ended up somewhere we weren't supposed to be. Did you guys and, used to see him around here in the Capitol? Yeah, and he, yeah, he came out and he came out. I was like, oh, my fellow Californians. And, was like, sure. and I was like, one, I was taller than that. I was like, this he, is he's, a, this he's is a nice, hundred? Yeah, oh, he's great. Nice, though. He's yeah, like nicest that. guy. But yeah. I'm like. This is who we he's were all afraid of? He's a guy who's definitely worked his way up. Yeah, like, oh, uh, yeah. I know this is, like, off topic, but I recently watched his Netflix special, and I was like, dude, like, this guy worked his way up. I have to see that. I haven't seen that yet. Oh, man. Is it all good. about his climb and everything? And it's his, everything, yeah. but I'll be honest with you. It, it can be a little depressing at the end. Yeah. yeah that like, sense. you know, because sometimes that's how it goes, right? It's very true. It's very true, and I, that's what I liked about it is it, he was, it was honest. He was honest. Yeah. It's, a, it's a struggle, this career field, you know. To stay relevant, first of all, just to be working, period, and then to stay relevant on top of that, it's it's just, it's a lot of work. Yeah, It'll and so I was like, kind of after I was like, oh man, like it looks all like glitz and glamour, but it can be like it's a lot of work. I mean, there is a smaller percentage of us where they're just riding a, a good wave, and that's that's kind of the metaphor you can use. You catch a good wave, and some waves carry you for the long run, and some 
or great rides, and then they peter out, and then you got to catch the next one, right? It's just kind of like that. And that catching it means like continuing to sharpen your skills, work your craft, stay relevant, stay motivated. It's not always easy to stay motivated. I could see that for sure, because yeah. eventually, like you're doing stuff, you're doing stuff, but then it feels repetitive. Right. It can be that sometimes. It can just be about how difficult it is to to get work. Yeah. Like even when you're somebody who's got a little bit of a name, I'm not necessarily in that category. I'm, I can get smaller independent films, but the even when you're somebody who has a little bit of a name, sometimes it's just a matter of it's up to the producers and the director. It's up to their whimsy and in terms of how much they think you're still relevant and how much they still think you're a hot item. I've been in the room where some producers have talked about name talent that they're going after, and just the way they talk about some of these people, like they're just items on a list, which makes sense from a business standpoint for them. But as a performer, I, I listen to that sometimes. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's hard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's but I'm in that category, yeah. so it can be heartbreaking. Yeah, because yeah. it's a little like sometimes I try it. Like it's hard to relate it to sports, because sports is pretty black and white, right? It's, it's like sports in, in a way, the sense huh? that you can well. Unlike sports, you can still mature and uh, grow and blossom late in your career field as an actor. Whereas sports, you'll tend to hit your peak and then you may decline. But there are some sports heroes out there who have shown us otherwise, right? LeBron James. Continue to, what's that? Look at LeBron James. Th there you go. He's so, like in 21st year. But yeah, sports is a good... A good uh, the thing about sports, though, is if you're good, if you're just good, uh, and you, you, you hit all the physical numbers, you're... You can't help but be noticed, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, the entertainment industry, uh, as a performer, actor, performer, it, it can be more subjective. Okay. Yes, if you're good, you will push through and shine. But it, it, it's also there's a lot of sub subjectivity that's involved that can mm -hmm. that you have to sort of negotiate. Right? You have to like weave your way through, right? Some things. Yeah, there's a lot of really talented people that are having a hard time working. You know. And, and People who are well-known names in the business uh, will say that about their friends, and even you know, people like myself who are, are still working on trying to climb in our careers. I have friends that are amazing actors, and they can't they can't even get their first job yet still. So mm. it's just how it is sometimes, you know. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So I'm just curious, like what what have, what have you been up to recently? Like I know that there's a writer strike going on. So does that allow you to work still or no? Because like I can't. I can work commercials. Yeah. It, has, it okay. hasn't affected the commercials. So um, I actually missed an audition for a commercial being here, uh, which is fine because commercials are a crapshoot, right? Mm -hmm. That's a, that, those are side bets, side gambles. Okay. Because it's they're so subjective. Also, it's up to the clients, be it Lexus or Toyota or you know Ford or big bank, whatever the clients are, they have their ideas of what they want, the ad agency has their ideas, then you have the direct. So there's just, there's a lot of variables in there when it comes to commercials. So I always looked at commercials like they're just gamble side bets. Okay. So it's not a big deal if you miss a commercial audition. You might not have gotten it anyway. Dang. Um, well, thanks, man. Pretty yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, so I'm man. here instead. This was, this was a short bet, right? <laughs> so, uh, but... Uh, there's no work going on at the moment outside of the commercials, um, but I um, unexpectedly signed a publishing deal. So I am writing a novel. I have actually already written a novel, and that's how I got the publishing deal, and I am in the middle of uh, ed the editing process. Uh -oh. where we're doing several passes on the manuscript to um, bring the story... Uh, enrich the story, enrich the world, and give the story uh, the potential to be a franchise. Can you talk about it? I know, I'm thinking the same like, thing right now in my head. I'm like, can I you can. I can. Um, I started out writing it originally for Devil May Cry fans. So it takes okay. place, it takes, it was actually a script that I had written 15 years ago. Um, and had nothing to do with Devil May Cry, but it, it was um, a similar subject, which was fiction, a supernatural, mm -hmm. right? War between heaven and hell. So our two protagonists in my novel find themselves caught between the war, in the war between heaven, in the middle of the war between heaven and hell. Um, and there, there, there are guys themselves who are not great guys who uh, are at best going to receive purgatory 
Yeah. Mm. Be, or at least make it to purgatory. So they're trying to redeem themselves. So this is a story about two ex-cops. So these guys are not the spawns of demons or anything like that. Yeah. These two ex-cops who find themselves, um, they were hard chargers, to use a term in police culture. Uh, and they, it, they were fighting the war on the streets to protect us against the growing numbers of gangs that were going on in the Rampart Division. So these are ex-Rampart cops. I'm totally going to remember that phrase yeah. and ask my brother and wife. My wife works in detectives. And my yeah. brother is a, a deputy. Yeah, so, so I'm gonna ask when, him, the Rampart, like, what is this? when the Rampart <laughs> Division went down, there were some really bad cops. But there was a lot of other cops that were involved in the crash units that resigned and uh, because they were encouraged to push the limits. Um, and so this is an examination of what happens to a person who's encouraged to fight hard for the right things but ends up losing their morality mm. in the process. Dang. So it's, you know, it's more a look at these aren't just people who come out power hungry uh, wanting to abuse their power. I think they end up on that path from fighting a hardcore war, right? Mm -hmm. So these guys are, the two protagonists are in this situation where that's how they find themselves, their souls potentially owned by good old Lou from down below. Mm -hmm. um, Dang. This, when we, when we catch up yeah. with them, they're bounty hunters. They, they've resigned from the police force, so the only thing they could do is find a career field that's similar, yeah. right? So they become mm -hmm. bounty hunters. And that's based on my experiences. I was uh, trained to be a bounty hunter. I was actually hooked up with a couple of ex-LAPD cops who wanted me to be part of their apprehension unit, uh, which meant I would put on some of my stunt gear and tackle dudes. <laughs> I was supposed to wait behind the house in case dudes come, come running out the back side mm -hmm. and, and tackle them. <laughs> um, they wanted me to carry a gun, so I was going through training with them. Um, and, and I was a little concerned about that, you know, uh, but uh, I, w I guess it would work out legally somehow that I would carry a security license and I would be a security, uh, under working under a security contract with them. Stuff that started to get more dubious as I delved into it. And then it turned out that the main person, the main bondsman we were going to work for, uh, had some bad relationships with some mafiosos oh. and it, oh. all, it all disbanded and it was a really interesting look at how seedy the industry can be which actually is a I know right now it's undergoing some there's some le, there's some people in legislation that want to tighten up some of the laws that govern bounty hunters mm -hmm. um, so that was a very interesting experience and I use that as a source for the backdrop of who these guys well, are. Well, it sounds like a movie, though. Dan, Dan reminds me it of It was originally movie. written as a script. Yeah. Um, everybody I gave it to loved it, but it was like a $10 million script, right? Mm -hmm. And I was oh. a young, up-and-coming filmmaker, and so the thing you should do is write something that you can make that's independent, mm -hmm. that's cheap. But, I, but it was my first time writing something, so I just had to let it flow. Mm -hmm. And it sat around for a while because it's too expensive to make. Um... So I converted it to a novel, a manuscript, and a publisher got a hold of it, and we met for four or five hours, and then he said, he's like, yeah, I'll read it on the weekend, and uh, brilliant guy, I think. I love working with this guy, by the way. I'm very lucky that he just decided after our meeting. He's like, oh, maybe I'll read it tonight, and then the next morning he got back to me and said, I want to publish this book with you. That's awesome. So, I mean, you guys already seemed intrigued and piqued by the idea. There's yeah. more there that's going on. Basically, the, the premise that you start off with is these guys are bounty hunters for Satan. And their job is to return demons, escape demons to hell. That's the that, idea. That sounds cool to me. That <laughs> reminds me of a much serious version of the show Reaper from back in the day. Yes, oh, yeah. there are a lot of, there's, so yeah, I'm reminded by my publisher part. that this is a very popular genre, it's populated by people who are doing yeah. content, and so the good thing about that is we have models to look at for what was successful mm -hmm. and things to steer away from so that we can be more unique. That's cool. So we're doing yeah. some unique stuff. We're trying to avoid a lot of cliches mm -hmm. as best we can and have original ideas of what this world is like if if it's in, how how it's inhabited by different tiers of angels and demons and 
This is so sick. This is so sick, right? So That's sick. what I'm thinking in my head, too. I'm like, this is going to be fun to read. It's yeah. going to be fun to read. And so the idea is there is no hell. Hell is earth. And so they exist among us. Man. Mm. And There's, you have to you have to be endowed to be able to see them. So it's very interesting, which would cool. make sense yeah. why you end up having possessions and feeling yeah. spooky and have seeing ghosts. Yeah. It's because they're there with us. That's funny. They're just... In a different dimension. You know, one of Marcus's dreams is to write a book and get it published. Yeah. He's in actually, uh, he's finishing up the English major right yeah. now at school. Bro, he's almost do done. Creative writing minor and all that. Oh, dude, yeah. I did creative. I, I did creative writing in college and I did mm-hmm. um, critical critical uh, thinking uh, English courses in college. And I was more of an academic writer, but uh, I always did pretty well in the creative courses, yeah. so I recommend sticking with it and writing. That's like I his will. favorite thing. He's I always will. talking to me about, hey, man, I'm just hey. writing this for fun, hey. for fun right now, just like yeah, messing I'm, with stuff. Like, I have all these, like, little, like, Power Ranger, like, spinoff stories and That's stuff great. that Keep I'm, like, thinking it. of. But, like, and, like I'm going to say this right now. Yeah, this is proof. I get something published. First thing I get published, there's going to be a thank you to Dan Southworth. Because oh. <laughs> he told me right now. It's on camera. Keep doing it's it. on camera. It's on camera. He's going to keep doing it. So. My, my father always wanted me to be a writer, and I didn't follow that. that, that those, those, I didn't follow in those uh, those wishes from him. He, he was just always encouraging. He was like, I think you should be a writer, kid. Good. And I'd never, I'd never say anything. I became a stuntman. I became a martial artist. I did full contact fighting. And I became an actor. And unfortunately, he passed away um, a decade ago. I think it is a decade ago now. Yeah, it's a decade ago. And he would have loved to. He would have been delighted to see that I'm writing something and I've got a publisher behind me. That's cool. So this is for him. Yeah. Um, and that's why I'm saying to you, keep it up, keep I doing will. it. I will. It is. And and the thing I was going to say is, I, I didn't expect it to be such a pleasure to sit down and spend twelve to sixteen hours just writing, buried, yeah, buried on a laptop, just pouring over words and how they're how I think they're affecting mm-hmm. the reader and how I think they're are they are they capturing the image that I'm seeing in my mind it's it's a lot of fun yeah and I got into that whole thing to just to be a better actor so really yeah I got it I, I so so the reason I got into the writing was because I got a degree in script script writing Mm -hmm. and a degree in post-production and I'm about to get my degree in directing all during the COVID uh, pandemic just to stay productive and Mm -hmm. I just figured this will just make me a better actor Um, and now I may be transitioning or at least finding other things I can do besides just being an actor Mm -hmm. man writing books I'm telling you man I've I've been telling you I I read a lot more now and I enjoy what I'm reading more than what I see on TV. Right now, there's yeah. not a lot of good shit on TV. Nope. In fact, I think TV is a lot of shit right now. Yep. Well, TV's all going away right now. Yeah. Like as And streaming, too. Yeah, well, it's as... It's just, just inundated with a lot of the same shit. As <laughs> ridiculous as this is going to sound, that show uh, Riverdale on the CW, uh-huh. that just ended. Like, they yeah. had their series finale, but they said that's kind of the end of network television because I besides they're still the daytime soaps and that's still going to yeah. keep going... But, like, all these TV shows now, they're all, well, a lot of them moving to streaming. Right. But they all want to have these shorter seasons yeah. of, like, only, like, 10, 13 episodes. And they only want to do so much. And when it comes to that, they're going to be made cheaper. Yeah. So it's like, a, hey, if it gets picked up and continues, it go, it does. They're, if not, it's whatever. They're totally changing their the paradigm of their the way they operate yeah. and, and do everything. I don't know if oh, got, I just have to move around. Oh, yeah, move. Bit. Maybe. I'll, move. I'll, I'll be out of the theater. So, um, that's what's going on. Yeah. Forget why we were talking about TV. Just what oh, you've been up so, to. So, that's what I'm saying. So, um, I enjoy reading books so much more yeah. now because of that. And speaking of. And I'm reading them because I'm, in the, I'm writing, so you have to know the profession you're in, right? Yeah. But I'm enjoying the books I'm reading so much more than the TV shows. And I'm reading book versions of the TV shows, like American Gods. Yeah. And oh, I'm it's probably really better. enjoying it. Oh, it's so good. Really enjoying the book, yeah. It's so good. Yeah. yeah. You've read the book? I've read parts of it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Because I had a, a, a class last semester, um, and he we focused on, it was modern world literature. Yeah. And so we were talking a lot about, um, like, uh, Aboriginal and Native Mm-hmm. Uh, like cultures and storytelling and how 
like a lot of those myths and legends and stuff that they believe gets adapted into like modern day stuff. And right. that's what we, and so he's like, well, yeah, look at American Gods. And so we kind of spent like Brilliant. a week, two weeks, like looking at that and everything. Brilliant the way he just brought everything yeah. in. And that's, it's, it's semi in the genre that I'm writing. So. Yeah. So uh, that's why I started reading more of his, his Neil Gaiman's work. No, We're talking about Gaiman's Neil Gaiman great. and him. I like it. I like it. All right. See, Dan's been up to a lot of things. I'm but now, working my ass off, man. <laughs> you are. And this is what I want to know is, how did you get into Power Rangers? Like, how did you become Eric Myers? I worked my ass off for that, too. I started, um, I auditioned originally when they, when they changed the cast out. When mm-hmm. they did the cast change, the original cast change, uh, I auditioned for that. Um, it was me, Johnny Bosch, um, blanking on his name. You just said his name. Oh, Steve? Steve Cardenas. Um, uh, Karen. Karen Ashley. Karen Ashley. We, those are the ones that I remember. We were all, because they got, they actually, I remember because they got, they got picked up, they got their contracts, but we all screen tested together. So I drove down to LA, auditioned, in my karate gi. <laughs> so I did my karate. Yeah, Yo, you're yeah. ready. He's ready to go. Did a backflip in the audition, did my lines. I get a call a week back. Uh, they want to screen test you. We'll fly you down. So I was like, wow, that's great. So they flew me down to Burbank, uh, put me up for a week in a hotel, and we all screen tested. Um, all signed contracts. Oh. What happens is that phase is they like you all. They all mm-hmm. like you. So you all sign the contracts. You do everything. So you're ready to go once they decide they like you because they want to start producing. Yeah. Um, and then they, they, they mix and they match the faces with and to see how the team's going to look together and they think about the, our personalities as they've met us and our acting skills I think Johnny and I had the martial arts in the bag I, n- I don't know if uh, Cardenas what he did in his auditions but I know Johnny was I saw him do a butterfly twist so I was like oh that kid's good <laughs> I think he and I were the only one that were doing butterfly twists then so um, long story short <laughs> it's a long story um, they picked the people that they were going to use. They sent the rest of us home. I decided if I was already screen testing for a major television series as my second job ever, my first job, I did a commercial for Maxwell's Coffee in San Francisco. That's awesome. That I should drive down to LA and give it a shot. So I did. Moved down with $3,000 in my bank account. And I was like, yeah, I'll give it three months. And then I was like, it's gonna take longer than three months, so. Uh, I taught martial arts um, privately. Interestingly enough, I ended up teaching Van Damme's agent, Jim Burkus at UTA. Mm. Uh, I was a kid. I was dumb. Um, I didn't know how to play that relationship very well, and I lost that contact. But that was what I did. I taught martial arts privately, and I made some good money, good enough money to be able to, I don't know how kids do it these days. I mean, I had a nice ho- apartment in Brentwood in Los Angeles for $400 a month in studio. Oh. Uh, I mean, this, I know a girl who is trying to make it as a stunt woman, and she's struggling, and she's, her rent is 1700 and she's sharing uh, an apartment with somebody, right? And I don't know how they can do it these days, you know, um, go after their dream, get a day mm-hmm. job, and I'll make it all happen. So, that said... <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> yeah, it was hard. So uh, I, I ended up booking the live show version. So really? MCA did a live show yeah. tour. Yeah, yeah. That toured the world, mm-hmm. and I did that. I think I got the better end of the deal, personally. Think, yeah. In the sense that, I mean, the show's done wonders for Johnny Bosch in terms of you know conventions and stuff, too. But I got to travel the world, and I think we got paid more. Because I remember signing those contracts. That yeah. mm-hmm. But, you know, those guys have done very well for themselves. Went on and did three seasons. And, um. Did you I, like performing? I, 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 at the time, I did. And I, that was my background because I had done a lot of uh, martial arts demonstrations, and I was a national champion on the karate circuit as in a form of demonstration called uh, self-defense. Okay. So I had won a national title, and um, I was really good at it. And basically, it was just fight choreography on stage. Mm. But in this sense, we were trying to show realistic techniques. Mm-hmm. I got out right as it was starting to get a little bit Hollywood in the sense that people were suddenly doing backflips and stuff. Uh, I was like, okay, I'm out. That's not what I was in self defense. <laughs> for. for sure. I was showing real techniques that could work in real time. Yeah. And hope, you know, that was the idea, and then it was getting a little bit 
fantastic. So um, uh, anyway, so it worked out perfect for as a skill set for the live shows, and I played the Black Ranger. And then because of that, I after the show ended, I didn't I got I didn't go decide to go back. They went on tour to Europe. I went on tour to Mexico and Australia. We took a hiatus. They went on tour to Europe. I did not decide to go back. And because um, I wanted to be working now. I had a little bit of money in my mm -hmm. pocket now. Yeah. I wanted to be doing what I came out to do, not not run around on stage in tights. Yeah, so um, I ended up <laughs> doing appearances at shopping malls in tights because <laughs> corporate headquarters as a day job. So this became my day job. They hired me to do the appearances because I had experience in the live show. The stuntmen from the te television mm -hmm. show were too busy to do the appearances now. So they were sending guys like me out who they could trust to perform without hurting anybody mm -hmm. and be professional and know, know the characters inside and out. So I was doing the Blue Rangers from Turbo, the Green Ranger from Turbo. I, I did Zio. I did Zio Red. Zio. I did... I ended up starting to do red a lot because I was a little bit bigger and a little mm -hmm. bit more muscular. And then when we got together with the team, I was a little taller too, so it would just fit to look like I the Red Ranger inverse. So I ended up playing a lot of Red Rangers from Zeo, Lost Galaxy, Space, um, Turbo, Dino. I did Dino Thunder once. Oh, you did Dino I Thunder did, too? I did some Dino Thunder a little bit. That's your favorite. I that too. I love Dino Thunder. So I don't want to say that a lot already, but we, we traveled around the world that. doing that. And we did another tour, and on the second tour, produced by the same companies, except MCA. MCA did the first tour. It was choreographed by the stuntmen from the show. And I was also starting to work uh, with one of Jackie Chan's choreographers. I had worked on martial law, I had started to do. And so as a stuntman among the stunt community, I was starting to get a little bit of respect from that sense, because mm -hmm. that's not easy to work with those mm -hmm. guys. And let me tell you something, those guys are amazing. I don't, I don't even hold a candle to how amazingly talented those Hong Kong guys are. But I can hang enough to be a bad guy, right? <laughs> to work with them. And that, that, at that time, during, during the 90s and during the, yeah, during the mid 90s or late 90s, that, was, that afforded a little bit of respect. So they knew about me, we worked on the show. I was hired as the Lost Galaxy Red Ranger for the live Fox show that toured around the United States. And um, they had me audition for Blue Ranger, Lightspeed Rescue, I thought. I think it was. Chad? I think it was Chad, yeah. And then mm. it came back that I was too intense. <laughs> so I, I looked like, it was just my buddy telling me, he's like, so you want to know why you didn't get the job? I go, why? He goes, you were too intense, man. They told me it looked like you could kick the Red Ranger's ass. So in your head, you're probably like, I can't. So, <laughs> so this was the second time I've auditioned for the show, right? Yeah. I didn't get the part. I was just like, man, I'm never gonna get, I'm never gonna go on that show. That's okay. That's all right. It's not. I, I need to be focusing on my career anyway. So it may never happen. I'll just have done the physical stuff. And then I auditioned for the Quantum Ranger. I thought he was just a bad guy, right? Because he read like a bad guy. I'm like, this is a bad guy. Came in, did my bad guy stuff. They liked it. Came back for a callback. That was grueling process. I went back for three or four callbacks, I remember. Um, the whole time going, oh, okay, okay, all right. And then I don't think I realized that I was actually the sixth ranger until I was filming for the first time on set the clock fight scene. The, I'm sorry, the, the scene where I actually put my hand in the yeah, box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were filming that out yeah. in Ojai. And as we were filming it, we were filming the segment where I had that standoff with, uh, we filmed that out there also. Which so there's like yeah. two or three episodes we were filming out of, out of sequence, right? That episode happens when, that's right, he gets the quantum powers and yeah. then he's got the ranger and, he, and he's talking to Wes and he's like, no, you don't understand. That was when I realized, oh shit, I think I'm the sixth ranger. <laughs> and there's a twist on this. Because I was playing such a bad guy, I didn't realize that I was actually the Sixth Ranger. And it wasn't until I actually watched uh, some of the dailies, too, and could see the Time Ranger footage mm -hmm. 
that they had in there in some of the dailies. So, I know, long story, no, right? No, 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 but it's a great story. I was actually a stuntman on Time Force for two weeks. There was a scene when we were doing, um, we were fighting outside the courthouse in Van Nuys, and I was a cyclobot, and we had these big, giant, you know, broadswords, and it was cold, and the funniest thing to do was to smack each other on the ass with those things. Mm -hmm. During the cold, You and then inside the cyclobot helmet, you would hear the guy go, because he was just in pain, right? It was, and, and a bunch of guys. Yeah, for sure. With each other. Yeah. And it, it was just hilarious. And um, I remember that was an episode somebody threw up in their cyclobot helmet. Too. That's awesome. There you go. Right New stunt story. guy. Didn't, <laughs> didn't know better. Didn't want it's, it's a thing where sometimes stunt guys don't want to let other people know that they're scared or they're hurt or they're sick. Mm -hmm. And I, I as a that. coordinator, when I worked as a coordinator, I did work as a stunt coordinator for a while, too. I always made sure that the guys working for me were honest with me because then I, you, you're not going to get fired. It's just you do what you can to take care of each other, right? And if yeah. not, then we bring you back for another one. Anyway, this guy was sick apparently and he threw up in his cyclobot helmet. That's hilarious. And worked in it. Uh, <laughs> and they didn't know that he had vomited it in it until wardrobe came to pick up everything to clean it at the end of the day. <laughs> Funny stories. So then I get hired as a quantum ranger and I am now the actor on the show. Okay. We were just talking on the way here. Um, we live about 45 hour minutes, hour away from Sacramento. 45 hours away? No, excuse me. 45, 45 minutes, minutes to an minutes, hour? 45 yeah. minutes to where an hour. Where do you guys live? Yuba uh, City. Yuba City. Oh, Yuba City. That's where my father grew up, man. What? Yuba City? Born and raised. That's where my father grew up, man. We had a farm we out there. My father had a farm out there. That's Whoa, awesome. Yeah, we were wait. born and raised in Yuba City, California. Yeah. Yuba City, California. I may still have relatives out there in Yuba City, California. I remember driving to Yuba City, California with my father to meet his, aunt, his, his sister. And he would explain to me, these are the watermelon fields I used to crawl into and try to steal some watermelon. If you, had to, you weren't right, if you weren't smart and you got the wrong watermelon, you'd get a freaking husk full of wasps. Or, and he talked about whatever the neighbor's name was that shot him, shot at him with rock salt, caught him in the ass once too. That's awesome. Because he was a he was a little hoodlum trying to steal For the, sure. steal yeah, the yeah, watermelon, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> this is this Dan South of Nose Yuba City. Nose Yuba wow. City. Okay. Yeah. We're born and raised. I teach there. You were <laughs> born and raised. My father might have been born and raised. I was not. Where were you born? I was born in Colorado. My father was military oh. by the time. Okay. He did Vietnam, uh, six or seven tours of duty, I think. Damn. Yeah. Oof. Got a battlefield commission and turned it down. Did not want to do any more time in the army after 20 years. I don't blame him. Interesting man. You can move man. this time. You, you can move this time. <laughs> wow, right. there's such a small, just small world. Pretty That's cool. So that is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Now we have like a little connect. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to search up the last name. Southworth. Southworth. I'm going to figure it out. Look up I'm, the family. I'm going to figure it out, man. That's awesome. You said they had farms up there if his family did? I think they had a farm up there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because I lived, yeah. uh, I grew up in like the smaller towns sometimes in Sutter, a little outside too, which is like super farm town. The, the Southworths are a big family. Uh, it's not a ubiquitous name, but it's 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 a name that you will run into every once mm -hmm. once in a while. And if you do, it's very possible we're related, right? So apparently, from what my dad tells me, uh, they came into they they were w wealthy. They settled into Wyoming. They had a comp big company. One of the they had then they had a big fight and the guy one of the brothers that decides to move to California. They say if you move to California you won't get any of the inheritance and he went fuck you yep. and he started up our side of the family and that makes sense. There we go, <laughs> and um, Yuba City. I've I also love it. read like the the Southworth Paper Company is owned by a Southworth family I believe and they owned Kinkos for a while. These are all people I don't know. Right? <laughs> These are all apparently, if you go somewhere on the East Coast, you can, in Massachusetts somewhere, or somewhere on the East Coast, there's a whole cemetery full of Southworth, huge monumental Southworth gravestones. So there's a side to my family that at some point I will need to dig into and do some research over. I do know that there, a Mary Alba Southworth married the leader of the Pilgrims after they went through their ordeal and got established here in the United States. Uh, he married a woman from England named Mary Alba Southworth. So who wow. knows if that's the origin of our... I'll have to look this up. Very interesting. You're a historian, dog. I know. That's all you. It's very interesting. Yeah. That's awesome. Dang. 
See, you're getting everything here. Crazy. Um, on our way here, though, we were talking about uh, the recently they came out with like top fight scenes, right? Yeah, Power like Watch History. Mojo. Yeah, came out with top twenty fight scenes in Power Rangers. Oh, okay. And which one? What, you which one of mine and Jason Font made number seven. Like, actually, you're kind of on two two po- points. I think yeah, you're. Yeah. But you yourself with Jason Font from Time Force when you guys fought over for the Q Rex. When he's trying to stop you in that episode. Oh, that yeah. made number seven. Wow, that was a good one. That was a good and one. then number three was, I, is either number three or number two? Or maybe even number one. I think it's Forever Red. Uh, which fight scene is that? Well, just the, at well, the end, everybody. after yeah, when everyone's everybody. morphed and everyone's oh, arguing right. about it. I think that was number one. Made it into number one. But I have to say this. I think they messed up. If they were going to use one of yours from you and Jason Fonts from Time Force, it should have been like on the finale. When it was just the two of you yeah. against all those that bots, was yeah, that, was, that was sick. That was sick. And like, it was the two, you you blow up the clock tower. You're jumping out of there. Oh yeah. You you're still fighting with him, and I love the fact that you're still like, "Fuck you." Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh yeah. You're we still, said that. We go. That's you, the best. Is that I your still, character stayed true? You did. That was that was a lot of fun. Yeah. You're still like, "Fuck you." Yeah. <laughs> I'm not joining you. We're not the same. Yep. Screw you. And then finally, yep. at the end. The dad comes, and then you take the bullet. Yeah. And then you take the bullet. It's like, damn. Yeah. It's like that. And I'm going to say it right now, man. Your character was like the funnest sixth ranger since Tommy. That is a wonderful compliment. Yes. Thank you very much. Because think about it. Tommy came in, and they made him bad, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And all that happened. Kick- and that's what made him an exciting character. Yep. That's, that's yeah. what made him to me. I was like, dude, this guy's kicking their butt by himself at first, especially, mm-hmm. too. And, like, your character... I mean, I guess you acted bad, but a lot of your motives weren't super right. bad. Like, So that is the the core of the story I was telling you earlier. Somebody that can be so fixated and focused mm-hmm. intensely on trying to do the right thing that they lose themselves, right? So, And that was that character. Yeah, and I always tell them, I'm like, dude, like, the similarities are just there. Like, look at the, the Zord. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cute. And have you seen that they just did in the Super Sentai for the 45th anniversary? They did this whole season where instead of morphing into Rangers, they morph into like Megazords. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? And then I think their sixth Ranger, it's a fusion of the Q Rex and the Dragon Zord. Oh, shit. It's badass. Yeah, so you can, buy, you can buy the Megazord now. Yeah. Like you can buy, it's one of the most badass. It looks like, hecka cool. I've ever it's seen. It's so sick. It's a fusion yeah. wow. between the two. We'll, have we'll probably have to show you before we leave. We'll pull it yeah. up. But like, okay. it's sick. It, but, yeah. I was looked at him when he, we saw that. I was like, dude. They thought well, all the fans have been thinking, <laughs> like with these two, because your guys' Zords were similar. Your main weapon was really cool, like his main weapon, right? right. He had the right. flu. Mm-hmm. Your gun was just cooler than everybody else's, right? right. Plus, your suit was just cool. Yeah, the fact that I had like, that too. like everyone had the white, but then yours was just the black with the jagged edges and everything. To me, that was like, that's just so cool. It was cool. It, it, it was it ended up being a pretty cool suit. I was mm-hmm. glad about that because when I was. The stunt guy, there were some suits that I thought were just stupid. Like the Charlie Brown Rangers we used to call the Lost Galaxy. Oh, oh that's so funny. funny. We, used to call them, we used to call them the Charlie Brown Rangers. That's hilarious. That's awesome. yeah. Oh, man, I see it now. That's yeah. all I'm going to think of when I look at them now. <laughs> right? Well, Magna, those, Magna Defender was my favorite in that one. He's, but whatever. He's still Charlie those. Brown, dog. He's still yeah. got he no is Charlie Brown, he's too. You're right. Now. He's Charlie Brown, too. Oh, man. That's it. That's how I'm going to refer to them. How... How was Forever at? You know, at the time, I thought it was too early. You know, I, I felt like I it was it was only a couple of years when I finished my season, and all of a sudden we're doing this huge. But you know, we were a later season, so I guess it would it would make sense. We were f- almost fifteen years later after the original, right? So mm-hmm. it, I guess it made sense. Um, it was fun. I, I I wish. Knowing what I know now, I could go back and experience that again. I think I would have had a lot more fun. Yeah. Um, did you know, because you've done all the things of, like, doing the tour, auditioning, did you know any of them beforehand then? I knew who they were, yeah. Yeah, like they, you met I knew, them? I knew who everybody was. I knew what, every, I knew what was up, right? Mm-hmm. I think they knew, not, they knew less than I did. Just okay. because I had, I had such a broad experience with the show. That I mean, on my show, I had to explain a couple of things to some of my cast members every once in a while about appearances and stuff and how that stuff works. But yeah, I mean, that's how it was. I just had a sense of 
I, I'll, I'll divulge this one thing. I think, it, I think it's okay to divulge now. Koichi came up to me, the executive producer, at one point. It was just taking forever to get to my fight scene, right? And he came up, he goes, hey, I'm really sorry. We're gonna do your fight scene last, and that's why it's taking so long. I go, oh, okay, all right? And he goes, because if I do your fight scene first, everybody's gonna get jealous at what you can do, and then they're gonna want us to do a lot more, and they won't be able to do it. Because I was doing all of my own stuff. Mm-hmm. So I was doing a lot of that. So I think there was only like two times I was doubled in the show. And then there was, they used some stock footage for another piece where somebody drove off a bridge, which I was fine with. So, <laughs> yeah. So I was like, yeah, okay. Right. And we did some kick ass shit in that episode. Oh, right? you did. But That's... we did it at the end of the day. I was the last one to get in there. I was tired because I was waiting all day. And we did it because he didn't want the other guys to be jealous of what I was doing. I guess it's not fair to make that a blanket statement. Uh, perhaps there was one or two actors he was worried were going to get a little uppity if they discovered that I was doing all my own stuff and it, it mm-hmm. might have outshined them. I don't know. But that was what he said. Competition. Yeah, that's, that's how it was. So there, ego. There's a little oh, ego. Yeah, it's ego too. We were all I, especially because you're all Red Rangers. We were all young. So. Yeah. You know, I mean, gosh, I was... The, Still in my 20s, I think, at the time. Maybe I was 30. Um, but you, we were all still young men and still trying to be better than everybody else. You know, I think maybe one or two of those guys was uh, pretty mature. It wasn't me. <laughs> I, I, I knew how to carry myself, but deep down inside, I was like, I'm better than all of you. <laughs> and that's why I played the character I played. But one or two of those guys, and it might have been Font, um, I could tell we're just chill, really mature about it, and having a good time. So that's awesome. But I can admit it wasn't me. Man, every time like <laughs> that's like our, our obviously one of the best episodes ever, right? Power yeah. Rangers, like all of you are together. We were curious that last part where like Jason David Frank, Tommy does the walk away, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. everyone's talking. Yeah. Go ahead, Marcus. You get to a point where it's so out of character for Eric. I hated that line. I saw it. Now, was that scripted? Or it was, was scripted. it was, so that was okay. all okay because okay. I wasn't sure because a lot of some of that stuff that you guys were I felt like I wonder if this is stuff they came up on their own and they're like, hey, we're just gonna have some stuff or if this is like yeah, because it like, wasn't like natural to the character. Yeah, I know because now I know every time we saw Eric later like there with the wild force team up you were I don't want to say softer, but there was that, like, that wall was down with Eric. It felt like you finally were kind of, like, yeah, like the character was, think, like, comfortable. I think maybe where... they were going for that, that the character okay. had yeah. himself down. Now, I remember hating that line so much. It's possible that may have been something I changed it to, but I doubt it. Because I know when I worked on that show, I was always arguing about lines and this and that. Not to, Not to the point that it was irritating, but... I was trying to do a good job, yeah. and um, not all the directors were top-notch directors when it came to filmmaking and television, let's just be honest. And I remember having a, a few moments where I, I just, my, my go-to would be, well, let's just film it anyway, and then you can use it later or not, but at least let me get it out, and mm-hmm. then I can do, I'll do whatever you want. Yep. That was my compromise. And here's why I stuck to it. Um, I remember one of the directors said to me, it's just, he said to me, he exactly said, this was his answer, it's just going to end up on the editing room floor. And I went, that's your choice, mm-hmm. but let me film it. Let me get it out of the way. And you can do whatever you want. Mm-hmm. But at least I, I filmed a version. Because I know that you'll look at it later and it, and it may change your mind, right? Yeah. I was thinking like a filmmaker then. And um, <laughs> one time, and this is why I stick to it, one time, my choice made it on camp on film. My choice made it up there on air, and it was a director, Isaac Florentine. He just, I was the same thing. I'm like, Isaac, let me just try try this, and it made it in the edit. Do you remember and like that's what it was? the case? Uh, I think it was the thing about the sunglasses that I was doing, and and it was just a character moment, but the choice made it, and so then it was worth it mm-hmm. to go. Let me at least. Let me at least do it, and mm-hmm. you guys can do whatever you want. You know, at some point, you can't fight the producers and the directors of the show 
especially when it's television, because they, they're working on the, the whole Bible of the show on season yeah. five series and seasons in advance. But you do your best. To, to, that's your that's your job as an actor. Is you're being an artist. You're the head of your department when it comes to that character, and so it's your job to find those things and push. And at first, it was a scary thing to do because it was my first time carrying the series as a regular, and there's no leverage, and they could fire you, and you don't know. But now I know, as somebody with a lot of experience, that's absolutely okay to do. Mm. Yeah, you have to be aware of sometimes when time is tight, you know, and you have to really know what you're talking about if you're going to fight for something, and it's okay to do. That's your job. And a good filmmaker should accommodate that, yeah. mm -hmm. or at least have that discussion with you, right? So, and some over the years have, and some have been less accommodating, and those are tough moments. Yeah, like, because we, we talked about just that part a lot, just because that was different for the character we thought, you know. So, I don't, I can't remember if I, 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 know, I, I know I was a lot, I hated that line, my dragons are what you what was it, my... Your Q Rex would eat my Q Rex would eat I hated that line, so I'm sure I didn't write that line. And then there was like the chomp and the oh, yeah, whole the, like the, the whole that, that, you that that was me. I was okay. like, how in the am I gonna do this? It is so out of character that maybe what I need to do. So what I decided to do was I just need to go for it yeah. because if I just kind of do it half. It's just going to be like, oh, yeah. that's just weak acting or, you know. You, you have to go so just, far. I was like, <laughs> you know what? This line is out of character for this character. So let me just be out of character for this character. That because makes it'll sense. surprise it that everybody. It'll just surprise everybody. Mm -hmm. and, it, and what it'll end up becoming is a aspect of his personality that has been hidden and suddenly revealed because we're getting to see more episodes with him. Mm -hmm. We're getting yeah, to see him now true. that he's been a Silver Guardian, yeah. accepted as Quantum Ranger. And so, like what happens with most people, once they've been accepted in their position they've been fighting for their whole careers, then you start to see other layers of their personality that yeah. no longer have to be withheld and hidden. Yeah. And so that's why I did that. Letting and the down. I am so shocked to see, again, it paid off. You know, yeah. it paid people off. People remember it. Oh yeah, like so, yeah, that's cool. last moment. people love that. People love that. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's the similarities, like we said. Like you reminded me a ton of that character, yeah. the original Sixth Ranger. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. So like it was just cool the interaction. Personally, I still think it's cheesy when I look at it, but that's not up to me to determine. It's up to the audience who loves the character, right? It's their interpretation of what that is, and it's a good instance of. Not being afraid as an actor to go for things, you know. So, after that season, we, we talked about this on a, a previous podcast episode. Um, there was talk, supposedly, of a season <clears throat> called Power Rangers Hexagon. You ever hear anything of that? No. No? Okay. Yeah. We asked um, Selwyn Ward yeah. once before, too, oh, okay. that we met him. And he said he didn't hear anything either. Yeah. Um, it was like a possible, what was it, a showrunner was the one yeah. who was saying that? Like, I guess they were developing it, but this or was... A web series? No, it was supposed to be the when they adapted season, uh, Ninja Storm. So it had nothing to do with Hasbro? No, no, no. Okay. This was back when Disney first bought it. Uh, so when Disney came on and bought it from Saban, Wild Force was like that weird, I guess, like yeah, kind of in-between child, but then they were not, Ninja Storm was the... They were not the nice when they came in and took over. Yeah. They were very cold. Yeah. The executives. And so they, uh, this was supposed to be their, what they wanted to do. They, well, rumor has it, apparently from the showrunner, that the setup happened in Forever Red, where it's mm -hmm. supposed to be like how we have the Pentagon. There's going to be a hexagon, because always six rangers. And then Tommy was supposed to be almost like this Nick Fury type character. And there's going to be other rangers yeah, from other teams Yeah, that sounds and stuff. way too good to be anything that was being spawned by the producers on. At the moment. Yeah, I remember the, some of those some of those scripts we read. It's like, why don't you get why don't we? Here's the thing: the Quantum Ranger stands out mm -hmm. and is a favorite because the executive producer, I know he was trying to do this, uh, Koichi, was trying to grow up the show a little bit. Yeah, trying to push it in that direction it, towards what you were talking about. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Disney came in and went, "No, we don't want that." Yeah, I remember talking to a Disney executive, and he hated the Quantum Ranger. I saw him at a birthday <laughs> party. I was flown in <laughs> to a kid's birthday party to appear as the Quantum Ranger. We ended up talking because he's there, and he's like, yeah, we don't like your character. We're going to squash it. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting because 
I know our season did 33% more merchandising than all of the other seasons. Well, yes. your season, <laughs> besides I, was, I wanted to hear what he had to say about yeah. it, right? He's like, yeah, it doesn't matter. We're doing and I'm just like, who is this guy and why? You know, and of course, they, they sold it off to, to, to India. They went to India mm-hmm. and produced it over there. And it, I just think it's hilarious. Well... I just think it's ironic that uh, the Quantum Man Ranger beca- ended up becoming like this, probably the top five favorite Rangers in the whole. No, if you in yeah. all of the seasons, right? Well, 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 yeah, yeah. To the chagrin of that executive who told me they were going to squash the character. I got you on this. One. But I did it's... understand the gist of what he was talking about, which was they did not want to grow it up. So yeah. I find it difficult to believe that. The hexagon is that what it was yeah. called? Would have been something that might have come from Disney because they were trying. They wanted to keep it still in the realm that it was, right where it was. Yeah, because I think they wanted it, and I, I'm pretty sure this probably spawned with Saban before Disney's involvement of kind of wanting to do that because I because everything about it, it's way more mature. It was going to lead to like a whole civil war between the rangers right i i don't know like, i don't know where that came from i don't yeah. imagine it came from saban either because he like he doesn't like to mess with a good true he does have his formula with a good formula i could see someone throwing out the idea and i think fans made it bigger yeah. maybe because, because the majority of yeah. stuff that i've read it's a lot of fan stuff yeah but then the showrunner came out and said yeah he was working on it or whatever but the showrunner i think his last name amit i know amit, amit. yeah yeah Amit, Amit was working. I, Amit was a writer on the show when I was on the yeah. show, uh, but he was not the showrunner of anything that ended up happening. Huh. So see, things. See, I think things this get makes sense. a lot as more as, sense. Yes, now. it does as far make way more sense. As I understand, sense. he's still a struggling writer. Amit, um, yeah. I hope he's not. I hope he's. But like, this makes much more sense, yeah. though. I think because I was like, when I had asked Selwyn Ward when we met him, I was like, hey, did you? But There's just rumors of this. Did you ever hear anything? I, or I do remember Amit having some really radical ideas that were cool that to me sounded like that would take this into the realm of X-Men. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I remember thinking at the time this would be a very popular show if they did grow it up. Um, and you know what I think? Because I've been saying it all the time. The formula is amazing where you have... The formula made it very easy to shoot the show several episodes mm-hmm. at a time and deliver on time and very quickly. And that is that you have the actors shooting at the same time you have the stunt performers in the bucket heads. Mm. We used to call them the bucket heads. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, we used to, the, the, then you can have a stunt team doing the fight stuff and they're not beholden to needing the actor. Just every once in a while you need an actor in there, right? For some overlap, mm-hmm. which is why you would see us doing some of our own stuff. I think that is exactly what somebody realized they could do with The Mandalorian. I don't know if there's a connection, Ooh. but Disney did have the property for Dang. a while. They yeah. were exposed to how it worked, how the sh- what the machinations of the show work, how the logistics of the show played out when, when they were doing, they were, I remember they were having all that stuff explained to them while we were shooting our episodes or looking over and they goes, this is how we do this. Mm-hmm. The stunt team does this and that's the stunt team. We shoot them on these times. We shoot them at the same time simultaneously. There's stuff like that going on. And so I, I'm, I'm really reaching, but coincidence? Well, no, I did read, there was that book that came out after the 25th anniversary, that like whole graphic, like, mm-hmm. um, history yeah. of it and in there they're talking about how every time like almost every season that Disney produced kept getting cheap like they kept cutting back further yeah. and further they so, they're like oh you did this for this much well the, now we're only going to give you this yeah. so, so, so the first thing they did was that crew had worked I felt so bad for the crew they worked so hard to, to finally become union and then, mm-hmm. and then like a year or two later Disney buys it takes it to New Zealand and they go now I'm union all those people were out of work yeah and I just I have a problem with capitalism run amok in the sense that you take jobs away from people to increase your, to minimize your overhead and increase your profits. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when you have something that's working great for, I don't know how much more they thought they were going to make doing that. I know, well, I mean, when we talk of bare bones, it does make sense though. When you think about, I know our show, our season, was costing somewhere around seven hundred and fifty thousand an episode. That's what I'd heard. I felt like it. Looked, it's hearsay. It your show had a 
It, had, it, had, it, it looked that great. That budget. It like, I remember budget. telling this guy that we watched and the I first think, episode. Now, what remember, is? that show only sells to Fox, to the te- television mm-hmm. network, for 200000 That's all they pay for it to air it, right? Something like that. But the show was making a billion dollars a year yeah. in merchandising. I remember seeing those numbers when I was working in marketing, that this show was turning in astronomical um, numbers in terms of merchandising, right? And that's what was funding the show. They were mm-hmm. just taking some of that merchandising dollars and funding the show. So this is what I understood. I'm not saying this is in stone. From hearing things in there, here and there in the office when I was working in different aspects of the show. So Disney's a, a very shrewd company. They're mm-hmm. not going mm-hmm. to spend, they're not going to go over budget. They're nope. going to produce the show for what it can be produced. They, so they produce it for $50,000 in New Zealand sell it to network for 150 they make their money off of that i don't know if they have the rights to the merchandising or not i think i think this is just a speculation i think what might have happened was disney let the go show i'm sorry let the show go when they lost when they no longer had the rights to the merchandising because mm-hmm. then uh, why have the show yep yeah that's what i suspect um i am speculating like crazy and if i speculate anymore i could probably get myself into trouble so I, stop. <laughs> I have a question yeah. um <clears throat> Before your character really started showing up in that show of Time Force, the main characters were the Pink Ranger and yeah. the Red Ranger, right? Yeah. When you came in, then the kind of that dynamic. I showed him what a real man is. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I love that, by the way. Yeah, uh, but I just always told him, I thought it was funny yeah. that based off of merchandising, though, too, I was surprised that the character Jen didn't have more merchandise. Um, like, that I don't have any. I don't have I'm any just curious, wild, like, crazy thoughts about okay. that. I, I don't know what the numbers are yeah. on that. Uh, I have not seen the va- any vague statistics. Like I have seen vague statistics about the other stuff I talked about. Uh, so I, I wouldn't be able to comment. Okay, on that. I, I, was I don't just even curious. know how true that is. Except that probably what's going on there is that around the world, you look at the colors that sell and the predominant demographic that is interested in the show is boys. Boys and young males. Yeah. And so the colors and the rangers they're going to be popular are going to be the red, the blue, the green. And so you're always going to have a little less merchandising in the pink and the yellow Mm -hmm. from that perspective. Yeah. And that again is speculation. Yeah. Okay. I remember because when we I think it's pretty good speculation but it's speculation. When we talked about it too I was like it's also a different time period into the world right like and it's not especially like during that time yeah. period yeah. it's not like 2023 this, now yeah. where, you now know. you might find you might find those numbers are approaching even you know? yeah it's yeah possible. that's what i thought too it's possible and it probably will be more even now especially with uh, this upcoming season yeah. she's the red ranger yeah. yeah so okay i was always curious about that because i was like oh man she she was like the main character Do we have the first red ranger being a female ever this next season yes I, um i think leading the season leading, yeah yeah yeah. yeah, for Cosmic Fury on Netflix. That's cool. Yeah, the That's Pink Ranger, she's really turning cool. to the Red Ranger. There you go. Because yeah. they've had female Reds before, like with, uh, I know Samurai had it. Okay. I didn't yeah. know that. And then Samurai had it, but they kind of did it wrong. Like, she was like the, she was like hidden away or something. And oh. it was like a, they it was a thing just, like, they, they could have just, boom. Just, no. But when she came in, she was way more like badass than he was. And it was kind <laughs> of like, yeah. she should have just swapped yeah. it. And then, uh, I will but, tell you this. On our show, Jen was bad at, more badass than all of us, character-wise and kick-ass-wise. Just as a character, you know. Yeah, she was badass. She I, was I thought badass. she was awesome. She was yeah. Badass. I mean, you know, who knows if she would have been able to take out the Quantum Ranger. <laughs> oh, probably not. Come on. No, because I always, like, I it's remember there's that. I know, I know. <laughs> it is a joke, but no, it's true, because this is the thing. I remember one time we talked. Out of all the six Rangers, mm-hmm. Quantum Ranger, to me, top three, if not top, like, f- for sure, top five, if not top three. Reason awesome. being. I put him top three. You always have, like, as well, Tommy's always going to be in there. But yeah. if we take him out of the equation, I've got, on my top three, Shadow Ranger from SPD, White Dino Thunder Ranger, because that dude was just vicious. And then Quantum Ranger. Because Eric always had that thing where he was just like, Almost too stubborn to like stop. Right. Yeah. Like you were just gonna go. You were grinding all the time. Yeah. Bro, no, I didn't think he was gonna lose. <laughs> no. Just the way his character was, like he ain't gonna lose. He's well, gonna do whatever to it me, takes. he wouldn't lose anyway either. <laughs> but he had to make a he had to make a moral 
change. He had to have a, you know, yeah. he had to have growth in that sense. Your character, well, excuse me, at least the Ranger, Quantum Ranger, appeared in the 20th anniversary too, if I believe right. Marcus, Megaforce? I was not yeah. able to make it out there. They asked me to come out there for that, and I could not make it out there for that. Okay, we I curious. could not make it out there for that because I was a union actor. Oh, okay. And, oh, yeah, I'm going to switch back to non union. And Dang. the thing was, I probably could have done it, but Zag would have frowned on that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you guys are way too, at the time they were way too high profile. I was like, you guys are way too high profile. I cannot go out there and do and work for you guys on a non-union contract. After my season, I was working on a union contract. And then go backwards. I can't do that, guys. Yeah. yeah. I can't, I can't. And I mean, I mean, I would have done it. They, they weren't paying very much at all. But it didn't matter. I would have done it because so we, we we thought of that too. Mm -hmm. That maybe they didn't. Oh pay. no, they were paying not very much at all, considering right. But I but that's not what would have held me back, because I, I even said to them. I even said to them this. I go, look, you want me to come out there and try to do this non-union? Then if I get busted for that, you have to pay my fines, because I know you can get fined for doing that. Yeah. So I'm like, if so if the union decides to fine me for doing that. If you agree to pay my fines, which could be upwards of four thousand dollars, then um, then I'll come out here and come out there and do it for, just because of the character. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I didn't. Ever, I never got an answer. Mm -hmm. I think I said that to my agent at the time, and my agent didn't get a reply. Wasn't there others, Marcus, too, that you had said you heard that had yeah, to turn it down? Like Austin like, St. John was saying how like when they asked him, oh, because I remember originally he didn't make it out there, right? He, no, he didn't do it because they said they're only paying like. $2,000. It was yeah, 2000 huh? That's what he got offered. The offer I got was 1000 Oh. 1000 for the day. So oh. for each day we were filming, it would have been 1000 Yeah, and then I know Titanium Ranger, he had put out there, he got invited and then uninvited. Oh, dang. <laughs> like, he, he put out there on Twitter, like, saying, like, they had offered him, like, hey, we want you to come back. Because I remember at first, originally they were talking about trying to get as many of the Mighty Morphin cast. And that's what they kind of wanted to do at first. Yeah. And then that's when David Yost was like, no, I'm not going back because I was bullied all that for being gay. Walter Jones was like, no, I'm not doing it because they were racist He was to bullied me. on the show for being gay? Yeah. yeah that's what he did. Yeah, like back behind the scenes yeah. and all oh, that. That's wild Poor guy. And so they were saying, all, like, so they are like, yeah, we're not going back. But then J.C. Dave Frank was like, I'm going back. I'm going back as Tommy whenever I can. And, you know, and I get it. But then... So once that fell through, then it was kind of like, they kind of just did, like, you could yeah, see Frank, on there. They Frank, got, Frank was not who's going to come back? Frank is not a union actor. Yeah. So he could he could afford to do that. I was a union actor at that point. And I worked on the show as a union actor. Yeah. So yeah. it would so have been like, a really big, like, raising eyebrows. Why are you going? Yeah. That yeah. That was the only thing that stopped me. Legit, um, you know, the the work ethics and politics of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, you know. Based off of like this newer Netflix special they just did, right? Once and always, mm -hmm. there was after that. I felt like there was so much like other seasons should have a chance like to do this. Would you be stoked if Time Force had one like a, a special like? Yeah, that? of course. Yeah, it's fun to do. Yeah. You know? Did just, you get a chance just, to watch it? No, I didn't. No, okay. I didn't. But All it's right. you know that's it's fun to do. It's it, it's an iconic show. It's of course it's mm -hmm. fun to do it, but. I'd have to do it. It would have to be union. I still, I'm still For in sure. the union. Yeah. I can't. Well, I think they did. Yeah, Once and always true. when they did it, it was. Because yeah, that's what Walter Jones said. Like, that's why Yost he went too. back. Yeah, him too. Because it's union. They and I to. think yeah. because Dave Jones is staying for this new season, he's, I think they are yeah, he's union in season, for this too. last one. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I think he's going to be like the mentor role. But yeah. Like, um, so what would, if you guys, if Time Force got to do that, a once and always oh, man, type of thing? So cool. Of course. What would your, what would you like to see with the characters, or, or the storyline, or at least yeah. Eric? I am too are tired. You with, are you with Taylor? I am too tired after a long day of this convention to really <laughs> give you a thoughtful answer on that. Because, the, because the, the, the core, really my feeling about it is just bring him back and have him fucking shooting some shit, and I'm happy. <laughs> well, I'll say this too. I know you haven't watched the the latest one, the Once and Always. Mm -hmm. It did have more of a older vibe to it. Okay. Oh, yeah. Like there were some things they like, used their weapons. They like used the weapons. weapons, like actual weapons. Um, they admitted, like in the show, Rita kills Trini, and the daughter of hers goes, "She killed my mom." Like they're saying these words, mm. and I don't remember they did like that yeah. as a kid. Well, it kid was on show, Netflix. Right? It was a Netflix special, yeah. right? So yeah. completely different production. Yeah. Or perhaps. 
enough of a different perspective on the production from different mm -hmm. producers getting involved. So yeah. that's but that's what that's yeah. about. You know, that's not necessarily an evolution in the original production of it or from the original producers. It could be other producers mm -hmm. being involved who want to see that to okay. evolve. Or are thinking, hey, we need to evolve this a little bit more because our fan base is older yeah. now and maybe and they're adults. So, you know, and too, like, I'm sure they have the perspective of like, who's going to watch this? It's a 30th special, right? Anniversary yeah. special. It's, it's going to be the people who've been watching it since they were and kids. And they're all adults now. And paying for Netflix, right? Like, they're the ones paying mm -hmm. for it. Yeah. So they're yeah. the ones going to watch it. True. Uh, Marcus, you got anything else you need to ask? So one of your other side works that you've done. Um, Shakira's music video. Uh huh. Where you were super, where you play like a Superman type guy. Yeah, right? that was crazy. That all that that was just that just happened. We're just supposed to play some ridiculous superheroes, and next thing you know, she we're in the trailer, and she goes, "I I, I want it to be Superman and Batman." And they're like, oh, "We can't. We don't think we can get." The producers like, "I don't think we can get that clear." And Superman. I want it to be Superman and Batman, and then we have these like. Ridiculous costumes. One was huge angel wings, and another one's some ridiculous stuff. And then finally, she goes, "No, I want it to be Superman and Batman." So they go, "We can't make it Superman and Batman, but we'll do it like this." And of course, you yeah. get Bizarro Batman and Bizarro Superman, and I ended up being Superman. I think the stunt guy was at one point was like, "Damn, will you, do, will you play Superman? I don't want to play the Superman." I'm like, "Okay, I'll play the Superman." <laughs> so I played the Superman. Well, actually, no. What happened was I was supposed to play Batman, and the other guy was going to play Superman. He's blonde hair, blue eyed, right? And I was very happy to play Batman, have my face covered and everything. And <laughs> she goes, no, 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 no. And she looked at me and she goes, he looks like Superman. And he looks like he could play Batman. Put the thing on the guy's face. Yes, he should be Batman. And he should be Superman. So she totally determined That's who awesome. and what we should be. And I believe you as a Batman, though. I, would I could see that. I, I could Batman. honestly see. I could do Batman. Batman's more. You could. Batman is more aligned with the characters that I've played in my career, right? Yeah. And so. Superman is not. I'm not a Boy Scout. <laughs> <laughs> Man, Dan, this went way better than I could have ever good. imagined. Very this good. Is, I'm like, very happy we got a chance to sit and talk, man. Yeah. Like, you the city boys. Right? Like, right? how wild is that? <laughs> like, honestly, that's what I'm going to take away from this. This is the biggest takeaway right yeah, here. Yeah, man. Dude, he yeah. his family. You the city boys right here. Right. That's awesome. Thanks, Dan. Oh, yeah, My there pleasure. We go. The My pleasure. Oh, My pleasure, you guys. Thank you awesome. guys very much. Thank you. It's coming to you soon. Yep. Coming to you soon. Awesome. So, wow, like an hour, seven minutes later, yeah. right? Like something yeah. like that? Mm -hmm. Hour, seven minutes later, man. Um, I'm just going to say, man, Dan told us to go meet him during uh during the day of saturday sack anime which is the yeah. busiest day um i i tell people this too how you know it's going to be the busiest day and they they yep. assume it and they know it based off of previous you know. years it costs more to go that day yeah it's the most expensive day <laughs> it's the longest day it's open yeah and dan wanted to do it when he was done okay now on the website i, I i'm positive it said 10 p.m yeah on the website but dan then told us seven cool perfect um which meant me and marcus had to be there for a while and his thing was yeah you guys got a place to record right marcus doesn't skip a beat and is just like yep we do and afterwards that uh, and so that was funny it's like okay do a quick chit chat talk about yeah. a couple things and then we're on our way and i look at him i go well i guess we got to go find a place then right like because we didn't have one truth no, is we, we did not have we, one we didn't and because the last time our last interview with Steve Cardenas, we literally did that at his booth. We're at the booth, we just then in there, it was fine, worked out fine. But Dan's like, all right, so you got like you got a room. Got Which is funny though, because I will say this. I don't know if you caught this, Marcus. When we went back, just to say what's up to him right before um Marcus went back to yeah, wherever we got, and we'll we'll explain that in a second. Um, Dan looked and goes, Man, we could just do it here somewhere <laughs> and i was like oh no we, we already got a spot like yeah. we ended up having to go get a spot we actually did a few things like um we did we realized that like okay um we both want to be in the shot and that's kind of a thing like me and marcus have agreed now upon is that we both want to be in the interview because um if anyone yeah. listens to the podcast i think you can tell we both bring a different dynamic to the interview completely different 
So like when it's together, I think it's the best. <clears throat> so we did, we we're like, okay, we need to. Marcus is like, let's go to a Best Buy. Let's buy a tripod stand because we need to. Because if we're not, one of us is going to be filming. It needs to be recording. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, We also decided to use my phone this time because my phone's a little newer. I was like, hey, a couple of megapixels won't hurt. Extra. And then we went to the Best Buy and we're like, hey, man, maybe we should get a, a mic that just picks up everything. Yeah. And honestly, that might have been a great one of the better decisions, yeah. too. Uh, Marcus loves the mic now. You were like, I was like, do you want to keep it? And he's like, yeah, it's funny because at first we we're like, all right, man, we'll just buy this now. And then like, hey, guess what? We'll just we'll just go turn it back. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go return it. But it was like, no, it's it's good. So and it's good to use. Easy to set up. So and it was sounded good. Yeah. Positive. It sounded really good. Um. And we did that, man. And we just went across the street because, like, uh, right across, right. And the, they must have been um, bought out for the weekend, right? For Sack yeah. Anime. Uh, was the place we had to actually go buy um, wristbands to even get into the event. But we noticed there's like a ton of rooms everywhere, man. We're just chilling there. We're chilling in, like this, like, lounge area where the people were eating. And we're just looking around, we're like, maybe they'll let us use one of these rooms. And we're like, we're going to ask for sure. We're going to ask. Just and ask. we were willing to pay. We were going to pay. Like, we we're going to pay for yeah. however long we needed. Couple hours, that's what we assume. And uh we went down there and Marcus asked the guy, brought out, I guess, like a head like security maintenance guy. guy, security maintenance like security. guy. You, you didn't see that little like little stitch on hat? Well, <laughs> Miles, right? Yeah, Miles. Homie Miles. Miles. Part of me was like, This guy can't throw us out. <laughs> but uh <laughs> He was hecka cool. He was, I was he like, was okay, cool. yeah, cool. Where do you guys want to go? Yeah. We just and told that, him straight up. We were just like, hey, uh, we're here for the con. We're going to conduct an interview with one of the guests. Just wondering if there's like a room available we could use. And the guy yeah, was like, which is funny, yeah, sure, right? Come on, I'll show you. Yeah, he was super cool about it. I was like, yeah. wow, okay. Like, that's pretty cool. Like, Mm -hmm. He was cool about it, and he's like, "Yeah, um, you guys want this room?" And then one of the rooms I think was kind of thrashed. Yeah, so... people were like using it. it. Had like stuff from the convention in there, so he ended up taking us down the hall to a bigger one on the corner. So it was like double doors, all the space had like water in there and all that stuff. So yeah, it was great. It had yeah, it had water, <laughs> which which was cool. Um, and man, like uh, I just think it, everything worked out perfectly. Um. Did. The room was free of charge. I thought it was right. really cool. Uh, and I just think everything ended up working out perfectly. Like, I remember on the way, I was just telling Dan, I was like, hey, man, you can get a drink. There's a bar right here, man. And I don't know. You've had a long day. Maybe you want one. And at first, he was going to grab one. But yeah. then he stopped and said, no, I'm kind of tired. Like, I don't want to be I don't want to be on a down in the interview. Okay, cool. Um, And then, like, I don't know about you, Marcus, but like, there was a point in the interview, and I am like, you might even be able to catch me on camera. I'm looking at my watch sometimes. Oh, yeah. There's a I'm couple like, I was too. Because I'm looking only because I'm like, man, he's not in a bad way talking, but like, yeah. I'm like, he's given us a lot of time. Yeah. You know, because like, that's one of those things where like, we didn't even talk about how long. We just assume, ah, oh, man, it'll be this long and he'll probably want to get on yeah. about his evening. But no, he just kept going, man, and going and going. And um, honestly, it was great. Like, uh, he gave us much more than expected, I think. Yep. Like, what about you, Marcus? What do you think? Yeah, no, he gave us a great insight to, like, how things work in the world of Rangers. Of, like, not just, like, the show, the production of it, all that, like, how, like the stunt coordinating, all, everything. Because he's been in, like, all those facets plus like you said like you know he's moving more into like behind the scenes role stuff so it's like he's now looking back at has like a perspective with that now too so it's just like it was great it wasn't just like oh yeah i did this this was fun you know like you get those kind of generic interviews and like oh mm -hmm. so how was this oh it's cool yeah lots of fun this is my most memorable moment he he, he did like the most talking stories no he did the most talking yes which is what we wanted. Which is great. 
So if there was like one awesome like takeaway you came out of that interview with, what would it be? I think my favorite takeaway besides I'll, I'm going to be okay. I got two. Um, the first one, okay. you don't understand why. Homie told me to keep writing and all that. Like, and that's like a legit, like, I'm going to be selfish and said that. And like, he told me, yeah, do you keep writing? Keep at it. And then after I told him my idea for like a time four story, and he was like, that sounds really awesome. You need to do that. Uh, so there's that. But really, when it came down to the interview, though, was getting some clarification about Hexagon was finding out like because hey we asked him like as you guys know last episode we talked about Power Rangers Hexagon the season that could have been allegedly and I'm going to allegedly because now we know because it's like said before we asked Selwyn Ward about it he's like I never heard it but then we ask uh we asked Dan and he's just like well wait what showrunner they never had a showrunner mm-hmm. and so like, what's the guy's name it was like I'm, I know that dude Nah, he was just a like homie kept it real. Mm-hmm. And he was like, and he always had a lot of wild ideas. And him saying that, I'm like, well, when you look at what um Hexagon was supposed to be, that's probably one of the wildest ideas mm-hmm. of Rangers. So so yeah, has that finally put that to bed for you? I feel I feel like it has. I feel okay. like it has. Like right. it's like case closed on Hexagon. It yep. was it's just a fever dream. That's, that's two of the guys about. from that show that would have known possibly. Yeah, especially because he was literally like the season before, and then this, you know, especially part of the previous season too. So it was just like, and he's appearing in Wild Force. Like it's not yeah, like he didn't show up there multiple times in Wild Force too. <laughs> yeah. So it's like multiple times in Wild Force, and then Time Force previously, like arguably one of the biggest seasons of all time for Rangers. It's like he would have known. Yeah. Um. I'm glad we got final nail for you on Hexagon. Finally covered it up, you know. Uh, For me, um, I get, oh, I'll say overall, my favorite thing, I guess, um, no, I'll stay with one because I feel like it's a big one. Uh, The biggest thing for me that I liked is that he came across very comfortable to speak freely. Oh, yeah. And that was the biggest like uh g- like positive I took away from the whole thing is that he felt comfortable enough to speak freely, to say whatever he wanted. Um, spoke like real professionally as well, yeah. and he spoke very knowledgeably because he is. And I guess that would be my second takeaway is that, you know, I didn't realize. I don't know if you did, Marcus, but I personally did not realize that he has technically been around since the power rangers live show like yeah. a live action tour yeah as one he of the stunt guys performing. been around that long yeah ever since he tried out for the role adam didn't get it but that got picked for that mm-hmm. you know he's been technically on every set yeah doing stunts yeah. So to me, I was like, whoa, no wonder he has so much knowledge about some stuff. Yes. Like more than I think people realize. Yeah. Like he knows. And like we also, you know, the just the insight, like, why didn't you do this? Oh, simple. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? He, and he was very like, honest. This is honestly like an insider, like, like legit inside. Not like, oh, yeah, I was there. I was around. No, like this brother was around doing. Yeah, something. like you know, they even joked about the Lost Galaxy. They called him the Charlie Brown suits. <laughs> yeah, like, and it's funny. He was that, great. That's all I can think of now with those. Me too. Um, and then like the last little tidbit, I'll say. I just thought it was cool. Um, his his stunts went last. His shoot went last on that Forever Red. And the reason being, and he said it on there, he goes, I think I'm okay to tell this now, which told me a yep. lot, by the way, of why he right. said that. Read between the lines. Uh-huh. Read between the lines Read on that part when he says, I think now it's okay for me to say that the reason my stunts went last is because they believe no one could follow his. And he was and open with us, Marcus. Like, he was watched, open with us. I went back and watched that scene. Because uh-huh. he's talking about the first fight scene. The uh-huh. unknown fight. Yeah, which well, he, he said it, uh, he said he said it best. He work. goes, "We have like the first scene, but I had to film it last." Yeah, 
homie was putting in work because his morph his morph fight that was like nothing yeah because at first i went to that one and i was like but his oh. fight i was like really but yeah but then yeah his fight i'm like oh yeah, um, and he's yeah and he said that to where he's like yeah like i had to go last because if he went first if they shot it in the order of the show that yeah that he that they told them they think there'd kind of be a contest like people would get like egos would get hurt yeah. and they would want to reshoot which would take up more time which they the, got which yeah which we know as he was in time for us but there wasn't enough time um and i just thought that was interesting because and i'll say it here because episode 23 is coming up and we are going to cover this yeah I'm going to say, because he said, I think it's okay to say now. Yes. I think one of the guys was guaranteed to be Jason David Frank. Oh, hundred mm-hmm. percent. I think 100%. so. Um, because he, he, you know, he takes, he, you, even to the end, he took pride in being a martial artist. Yes. Like he went and fought was, MMA, bro. And honestly, and like I said, like you said, going into episode 23, that was the start of the whole thing between him and Jason was yeah their martial arts backgrounds and stuff <laughs> and that's the other guy i think he's talking they're talking about yeah yeah but what's funny is is that um man dan still trains he told us today he told oh, us yeah? then he's like i yeah. still spar with 20 year olds oh, hey by the way that was his birthday we didn't wish him a happy birthday we didn't, i didn't know was it that I day or the day maybe, after? Yeah, it was that day, September 2nd. Mm, I feel bad. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I think the best way to end this uh, podcast, <laughs> right? This one right here is to talk about uh, uh, we, we have a Yuba City connection with we Dan. Do. That's yeah, great. You have to listen to it on the episode, but we yes. actually do our small town, our small farm town yep. of uh, Yuba City, California. Has a connection with Dan Southworth, uh, yep. to where you could see his face actually light up. And it's funny when he says that you'll see my face. Like I'm literally looking like, nah, man, you bull. Like you can't. You think of the wrong Yuba City. I was like, <laughs> brother, you, I was like, you th- are you thinking Tuba City in like Arizona or something? Like, brother, you like no, there's no way. Like, and you see my face, I'm just like, no. And it's not until he starts like describing stuff, I'm like. Okay. <laughs> All right. Like he knows. Yeah. It was pretty cool. Um, it, it got great. me stoked. Uh we're gonna try to get more interviews of people for you. You guys, um, yeah, you know, uh me and Marcus kind of talked about it, and I'll say it on air. We think we can actually get more people to do this if we do it through like this, like on Zoom, yeah, or something. And uh we want to try, we're just gonna shoot our shot. Um, we're still growing, budding. We're not even the biggest Power Ranger podcast out there, by the way. No, we're not. We're not like there's way bigger ones that I'm like, man, we, we just want to get there one day because like it'd be great to just rep our podcast and like go to one of these crazy Power cons Morphicon next year. Yeah, that'd we be sick. Go, like a year from now, us be at Power Morph Con and, and have interviews like set up where people like know what's up. Yeah. If you're part of like the freaking press junket thing, if they have like a press junket thing where, it's like, where, you know, it's just a simple room, you go in there, they're already in there. And he was like, all right, you guys got like five, 10 minutes. All day. sick. Freaking awesome. Yeah. I think, I think the biggest thing lesson for us from this whole experience was just ask, just ask, just ask, just, just ask. Do you know, and I'll say, and I'll say this too, before we go out, um, because of Dan's first response, mm-hmm. I was ready to dip. Yep. I even messaged him dipping. Yep. I even messaged him telling off. him. Yep. Telling him we're good. We'll see you in the line. We're going to pay for a photo with you because yep. we can't wait to meet you. We hope you have the best day, man, because you deserve it. And he was like, oh, no, 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 no. What can you do? Let's make this work. Yeah. Cause that's how good of a dude he is. We found out even just talking to him. So this was probably our best episode yet. Going to say it, going to throw it out there and say it now. Yeah. Thought the last best episode, honestly, was this cosmic fury one we kind of went into Uh huh. that y'all didn't get to see. Cause your boy hopped on that YouTube copyright issues. 
But the but audio, you still hear the audio. Audio though. went through. Audio went through. You still hear the audio. So, um, you want to lead them out, man? Lead them out of episode twenty. Lead them out. This was episode twenty, a milestone, the big two O, Rangers of the Grid. It's Richard. It's Marcus. You be city zone, with the interview of Dan Southworth. By the way, happy belated birthday, Dan. Happy birthday, Dan. You a he a real one. He a real one. Yuba City's finest. We out. Grocery bag.